the bell rings, I'm finished. So, thank you for I won't start it until I'm about halfway finished. <laughs> um, so, as I said this morning, I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, how I think architecture has always been political, and how it continues to be political, and how, in a certain sense, uh, I agree with Mark that uh, we, we, our relationship to Derrida is best understood by not invoking his name. And I believe that to be true. We have absorbed Derrida. We completely in command of him. Unlike Mark, I'm completely at ease in the company of philosophers. Um, I'm just not at ease in the company of architects. So, um, but to remind you, I just uh, want to show you this picture. Um, I'm about to leave it behind. As you remember, this is from Bernard Schumann's Bart de Lava Lab. We discussed it a little bit this morning. And I want to call your attention to just one thing. Nowhere in my text or any text that was ever written about this project was that explained, not once. Uh, you can see it in the section here. I asked Peter about it. He said the, it was too, it needed some sectional activation. Uh, I'm going to, I believe that this is an intuition about what I'm going to talk about that occurred 25 years ago. Um, and so this relationship to the ground is going to be the theme of my talk. <coughs> Now, if there are two statements of Jacques Derrida's writings, I'm going to use my own translation that have affected me the most. One is from Of Grammatology, page 26 in the English translation, which I am now going to retranslate in my own terms. It goes, non-phonetic writing explodes the noun. It mobilizes relationships uh, instead of naming things. And this is the, and so for me, that was an extremely important, I thought non-phonetic writing came pretty close to architecture. So to explode uh, the noun is actually to challenge the idea of the object, which is also what the name does. And so to mobilize relationships is what I have always been doing since that day. Um, the other one, which I think is the, the, one of the biggest problems in the history of architecture's relationship with Derrida, is a very badly translated, uh, there is nothing outside of the text. Now, believe it or not, this is going to turn out to mean in architecture, everything was horizontal. I know how dumb that is, but that's actually what it means. We just, but there's a text that's thin, there's nothing outside the text, everything has to be horizontal. Had it been translated, there is no escape from context, all the architects would have said, fuck, we've been doing that all along. What's up, great. We, you know, we know all about context, you know, so, and it wouldn't have gotten flat. So just some, um, some interest on my part. Um, I became interested in, as far as I'm concerned, and if you look in, I don't know if you have this, but in English, like the Oxford English Dictionary, we have these things called uh, history of usage dictionaries. Um, the word critique in the contemporary supplement to the Oxford English Dictionary is described as a neologism by Derrida. It means it, it's not philosophy, it's a way of not being critical but it's a, it's a new way of reading called the critique. And, I, and basically, I think a lot of the work that we've been talking about is what it means to, be, to engage in a critique, whether one writes it or builds it or describes it. Um, I felt, I have felt for a while, trapped by the, the critique in the sense that it only admits of one, one ontology, one world possibility. <clears throat> so I look at this painting by David Sally, and I see two completely different ontologies. There's the realist painting, which is divided in the parent diptych, but it's in fact not. And then there's this cartoon that lays on top of it. And each of these obeys their own. It's not a collage. They, it is a simultaneous set of relationships uh, between two uh, irreconcilable ontologies that I would thought starts to me to become an inspiration for thinking how architecture can continue its desire to soften, release, even jettison its relationship to instantiated power. So if architecture can multiply the possible ontologies, it's another way of operating in the history, but, but after the critique. And that's basically my thing. Then I have some personal interest. I'm, I've become very interested in the figural and in the work of John Haydick. On the way here from the airport, I saw that fantastic set of towers. 
you know, it's, I don't know the name of it, it's the, the two towers and it, one's got a hat. It is the greatest building in the world. I, I, and I will, that's the theme of this thing. I love that building. But I see it in this room. This is a, a house by John Haydick. The work is so powerful that you can put a thing on it and it just looks like a booger. You know, so you see the two eyes, you see the, up, the nose and the lips, and then you put this thing, which would ruin almost all architecture, but it's fine. It just becomes a booger. But, yeah, booger. And so John has this incredible, but John's work, not John, John was a super tragic figure. I'm not interested in the tragic in architecture. I tried to make that uh, evident for my question earlier. We have the fantastic power of creating tragedy, awe, inspiration, silence, and reverence. We can create different kinds of quiet. There's the quiet inside a church or a synagogue, stained glass windows kind of quiet. There's the quiet inside of a library. Two completely different kinds of uh, quiets constructed by architects. I'm interested in architects that get you to talk, drink, have fun, dance around. I I'm sort of an eluding architecture. So I am the ludic side of Mark Wheatley. Um, and, I, and what I love about these is when you see these, it's almost impossible to see this the same way. It, you, you see the angel catcher in it. Or when you see the, the house of the uh, suicide, this is just form work for concrete. So this is architecture that transforms the way we see things by, see, by setting into motion certain kinds of relationships. And so that's how I feel like I'm true to the Deridian project and why I would like to discuss it in these terms today. Um, this is a great work. I'm going to ruin this great work for you. This is by David Smith, considered the, Ameri the greatest American 20th century sculptor, um, highly geometric. Uh, once you see this, it's very hard to see that the same way. So for me, it's, I keep seeing this and that. So now I'm going to show you something about, I guess, uh, Borgia. You hear Borgia? So Borgia is the student who came with me to the, um, from the airport. It was nice enough to ride with me in a cab. He's going to Copenhagen. I have a fear of students going to see buildings without having been taught by me. <laughs> so I'm now going to teach all the students who are going to go to Copenhagen what to look for. I'm going to show you a history in honor of what Mark Cousins. This is a chronological history of concert halls and, and uh, opera houses. It's just a chronological order with stylistic differences. <clears throat> I don't think it tells you anything. I think it would be very difficult to, even to, to, to continue the Wolflinian project. Um, this is the source of the most important acoustic diagram in the world. Every concert hall that's not an opera house is based on this building, which is the uh, horse, I'm sorry, this is the shoebox diagram. Every opera house is based on this horseshoe uh, diagram of the acoustic. And so as soon as you start to read the criticism of, of opera houses and concert halls and they mention the acoustics, it's over. You're not discussing the architecture. I think this has a fantastic political history, however. Um, this is Sharoon's Philharmonic. Sharoon's Philharmonic was the first building built in Berlin after the Holocaust, after the end of World War II. He had the problem of figuring out how to put a place for music in the city in which music participated in the propaganda mechanisms of that horrible event. And so it was very difficult. And so he wanted it to belong to the place. And so the color is the earth, is the color of the earth of Germany. The forms are derived from his expressionist period from the mountains and trees. But he's taken it, he's moved it off the ground. So I'm about to discuss these things. Here is a, here's my theory of the ground, which you're about to see. You can't see it very well. But this is Graham Coolhouse studying it very carefully so he can steal yet again another idea from me. And this is the history I'm about to tell you. This is land, datum, field, urban field, metropolitan field, cosmopolitan field. This is the evolution of speculative architecture's um, effort to change the most fundamental political relationship that architecture uses to support instantiated power, and that is through land. There is no such thing as the ground in architecture. In fact, there's no such thing as a ground at all. 
a ground is always, if every discipline has a different ground. Urbanism has a different ground. Landscape architecture has a different ground. Philosophy has a different ground. But there is that, but even then it doesn't exist. In architecture, for example, land is the legacy of feudalism. Um, and all of, almost all the architectural devices were to reinforce the significance of the ground as land and to state the power relationship between the building and the ground. It's reflected in the idea of the French term for building, which is immuble. It's also reflected in the legal, the legality of buildings, which are real property, meaning they belong to the land, as opposed to personal property. So in fact, um, it's the only real property that we treat as an object, as personal property. So it has a very common, and I think uh, Catherine Ingham's work on property and proper, which is dates, is continuing today, and dates way back, was sort of an inspiration for me thinking about this. This is, I think, the single most important page in the history of architecture. And anybody who claims that architecture has failed to think of itself in relationship to politics just doesn't know this page. And what this page is, is about changing from land to data. So, and through the five points. And then it, it, it continues to evolve from there. So you can see the building is lifted off the ground. Uh, it has a kind of floating relationship on the ground. So when you see it in the trees, it doesn't belong actually to the ground. It is the ground above the ground, which is a bit why I would ch challenge uh, Lillian's reading of Wolfgang's uh, building for the science industry. Uh, Sharoon, it was a fantastic achievement. He understood that he could not let music unify the audience into the kind of cohesive fascist group that music was, and so he breaks the seating apart. There are four floors. There are 16 seating, uh, 16 seating pieces. It takes uh, 11 extra staircases, and it takes a whole team of ushers to get you to your seat. It's almost impossible to find. But when you go in there and you sit down, you never sit in a single unified way. This is the Paris Opera House, and it belongs to the status. It, it reinforced, it does exactly what I said. This is a building about the ground as land, but so is this building. This is not actually a work of architecture. This is a work of nature, in my opinion. But it is a contextual building, and so, it, so these three buildings are all the same in their relationship to the ground. This one, perhaps the most advanced, in the sense that it is not a sculptural art. It is not about appreciating its form. It's about finding new relationships to the context. So instead of seeing it as a piece of sculpture, you have to see it as the two towers reflecting the towers in the background. This is the, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion across the street. Every curvature in Frank's building is based on that curvature. And so it's a new way of engaging the context by not simply imitating it, it mobilizes. So this is an architecture which is trying to mobilize relationships. But, it, it, but on the other hand, it is asserting its relationship to Los Angeles. It is exactly the opposite of this room when you go inside. It has a gigantic symmetrical auditorium that people have uh, commented on negatively. And the reason for that is simple. Unlike Nazi Germany, which was overly unified, Los Angeles is overly atomized. It has the most number of unlisted phone numbers. It has 30 different, not dialects, but speaking groups. They don't communicate with each other. It is a city of uh, individual or groups of nomads. And so he has this fantasy of bringing them together into a kind of coherent organization. Notice this relationship to the ground. We're now at, this is uh, the uh, Porto by Cool House. The, there is a real ground or is a real land. He artificially makes a land and then goes out of his way to make it enormously theatrical about not belonging to the place. It, so much so, look at this back, look at this. So it is not there. So I would call this, at the, this is now at the Metropolitan Field. And for those of you that are about to go to Copenhagen, I suggest to you that this is maybe the most advanced and interesting of all these projects. This is Nouvelle's uh, concert hall in uh, Copenhagen. For one thing, it's constructed as an ongoing construction. It's wrapped in a construction scene, screen. It doesn't belong, it's not finished, it's not there. Secondly, when you walk in, you go, you go underneath. You have to actually climb up into it from the bottom. Like that. And so, in fact, it has an interesting relationship in its formal language to this room. 
And so it is utterly detached from Copenhagen. So either it thinks, I don't want to belong to Copenhagen, or Copenhagen sucks. But this is what I would call a cosmopolitan field approach to the ground. And so just quickly, if I were to reiterate that, I'm just going to show these pictures. This is the picture of the history that I've just described. So just out of speak, but this is the, as you know, the walking city. This is the first idea that architecture's best way to challenge those things is not through Pelotti or two, going from a 2D to a two and a quarter D extrusion, but actually having the buildings walk around. A fantastic piece of visionary architecture. Then Bernard's brilliant Le Frenois changes the existing buildings into a new ground. I think this is one of the greatest works of architecture in the 20th century, um, despite the pigeon shit. <laughs> Uh, you know, Cool House's uh, uh, hysterical reflection on Pelotti, and if you remember the other cantilever, you don't know which is a real cantilever or not. So this is it. Get to this. So this is Will Alsop, Toronto, and it is a culmination of these history. It has the walking city in it. It has the Villa Savoie in it. It has uh, it has uh, Bernard's. Um, Love from White has uh, Phyllis. Was he at the AA when you were there, Bernard? Yeah. Yeah. This is also a kind of funny argument about being at the AIA at a certain time. But I think this building, and one of the things I love about this building is no matter what I show, everybody in the audience that's an architect hates it. <laughs> so they could like one, not like one, but they universally hate this building. And so I think I'm on the right track. Um, but I think it comes very close to doing this. So it sets into motion this idea of a new ontology. And so that's where the work is. Now, so Peter Eisenman, P.V. Arelli, and I agreed to do a project with Venice Biennale, and I decided I would make it a, 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 an absolute statement of my interest in the figurality of Haydick, my, my disregard for architecture that's um, seeks power, seeks autonomy, um, seeks sobriety, seeks tragedy. Um, and this seemed like a perfect place. Most of you will know the Piranesi plan of the Capo Marzo. It is a work in which um, it is full of architecture. It's a kind of fake city. Every square inch of it is full. Um, it's on the Capo Marzo, Marzio, which everyone yeah. I like it in pseudo-English Italian. Uh, <laughs> but if you know anything about the Campo Marzo, at the time that, of Rome, uh, that, that this was supposed to depict, it was no man's land. It was outside of the city. So only people, you could build churches there that were in heretical reli religions. You could come there from um, countries that were at war or not, at, uh, not uh, allies of Rome, and your, and your diplomats could stay there. So this was a ground which was not land. Um, and so we did three, it can't be 30 minutes, I think. That can't be, right? Am I done already? So this is Peter Eisenman's project, and you can see it remains flat. It remains dedicated to the language it begins, but it doesn't actually have the tilt. It starts to dig into the ground a little bit. This is P.V. Arelli, an evil guy who loved the table. <laughs> Uh, and so he does this project, which is just a field of walls. And so he has this idea of an absolute architecture uh, born in real geometry, which has a kind of intimacy. It's almost more Heideggerian, although he would like to inscribe it in the thinking of Nietzsche. Every detail is a Heideggerian uh, soft touch. And so it's absolute geometry that engages each moment of the ground as land in a different detail. So it's quite a beautiful project. Now, for, as far as I'm concerned, what's the, the, work, the act of deconstruction is not in my project, my, my project being the best, Peter Eisenman's project, or PD's. It's in the relationships between the three. These fantastic hand drawings. You can see here how each element <coughs> in the wall, and this absolute wall, is detailed with a different relationship to the, to the This is mine. This is what everyone should be doing as of this moment. Um, this is called the Field of Dreams. What I have done is taken all the works of my friends, Jose Ubre, Greg Lynn, Jesse Reiser, all of my friends. And by the way, I guess I should tell you, if you're a student, 
Go meet as many famous people or people that you admire as you possibly can. It is the single most important thing you can do. It's why you pay tuitions to go to Harvard. It's, and the reason it's so important is not because they can teach you anything special. Actually, the better teachers are not at Columbia, not at Harvard. They're at Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> but once you meet these guys, you'll realize they're just as dumb as you are. And that it's possible. And it really is true. So the demystifying effect of direct engagement with as many people as it has captured your imagination, I think it's the crucial moment in your education. Go meet them. So uh, there is no ground. This thing is floating up on the top. A bunch of straws. There's a ground here. Then there's stuff inside. Every place you'll see it. And then so it's organized so there's heaven up here and hell down here. And known earth here, so it has a strong narrative quality. But you'll notice that the architecture, and by the way, here's an important thing. I can speak to Mark about the drawing. How you do an important theoretical project is you start with the initial condition, you do a completely absurd and ridiculous drawing by putting as many lines as you can. So the kid came up to me and said, is it done? I said, no, more lines, more lines. Make them red. Everybody will think they're really analytical if they're red. So lots of red lines, it's really important. And, and from this we discovered that everything is slightly oriented, oriented toward the river and slightly oriented to the north. So that, that's the exact sum of this analysis. Then you put your project on top of it, it looks just like you belong to this. So then, as I said, all of these are, there is nothing original in this, there is no architecture, but Everything you see is derived, in fact, from either the Peronese scheme or the works of my friend. If you'll notice, for example, where am I? Did I show where I show? Okay, you see right here? See that thing that looks like a dog's face? There's the dog's face. Okay? <laughs> work, work easy. Um, then you have the agon, the, the fight between black and white as the bridge of the river. This is all, this particular part is based on the work of Andrew Zago. This is his cantilever proposal for a soul. It's a building that actually like a, like a contortion, I'm sorry, it's called a contortion. Imagine a contortion that puts its head all the way through. And the building goes all the way around, self-structuring, goes all the way through. We just took that. Give me one second. This is an unstable ground. I don't really like that. Does anybody see bell breaking on here? Ah, shit. <laughs> no glasses. Find bell break for me. <laughs> My savior. Bell break, bell break, bell break. It's not there, is it? down here somewhere. Anyway. By the iTunes. By the iTunes. By the iTunes. Okay. Fourth row up. <laughs> okay, so this is basically what we did. Start with Andy. Bring him to life. Meet everyone. This is now a three-dimensional architecture. Not an extrusion, not a two and a half D. Belongs to the cosmological field. Um, and then I'll just show you how things get set in motion. Same exercise with a half a dozen of my friends, plus Jose Ubri. Jose Ubri is the architect of that you would know in, because he worked with Le Corbusier on Fermi Church, which he finally got built after 40 years, plus he's done Two masterpieces that you may not know. One is the Miller House in Kentucky, and one is the Syrian French Cultural Center. And, um, so, we are with the ludic. Notice that each building leans on another. If they have cantilevers, but there's no celebration of structural strength. There's a good kind of relational dependency. There's, there's no ground. We took this wonderful church, which I think has a funny face. Uh, this is Le Corbusier and Joseph, good-looking young man. There he is working on a project with This is me having a theory of how you put a pipe on Germany Church. There's the pipe. 
This is Peter Eisenman's uh, Max Reinhardt, one of the most important buildings along with CCTV and, and some by the Will Outside, which actually is no longer attached to the ground. This is a 3D architecture, not 2D, not extrusion, not like the work of Piranesi, not 2.5D, which is where Corb starts and goes all the way to Stan Allen's Matt Building's theory. This is work that actually cannot sit on the ground, acting as the gates of hell. This is Jesse, I Jesse Reiser's pro study proposal for the uh, Taiwan courthouse, and now they show up as the snails. So it goes on and on. So I suspect, I suppose that what I would like to leave you with is uh, it's always important to read. Read philosophy, read comic books, read everything. It's also really important that different people read different things. It was really not a great thing at that time when everybody was reading the same thing. And uh, because it kind of got in the way of my tenure and stuff like that, it was you know, really sad. Um, but you have to derive your project from architecture, and you have to understand architectural effects in a way. You have to know that we've been doing political work on the ground longer than any 20th century philosopher has argued about. It, and, but on the other hand, you cannot be victimized by a false invocation of building as a response, social and political responsibility. Homeless. We, like it or not, when we produce architectural effects, they will not speak to that. 6% um, of the buildings in the world are by architects. Virtually none of them are significant works of low-cost housing. Um, we produce a set of effects that much for me, that it's much, much more belongs to the art world. Now, at the time that, uh, in 1950, when Autumn Mist was painted um, by, by, sorry, Jackson Pollock, this was the year that uh, the hydrogen bomb was first exploded by the Soviet Union. All the artists at the time were feeling that they needed to directly address political commentary in their art. So there became a huge movement of slogan art. Plus, they were attacking the solipsism and self-indulgence of Pollock. For the first time, he received really negative criticism. Um, to the, and in fact, some of his uh, critic apologists said autumn mist was meant to look like the mushroom cloud. I don't know if you've ever read this, but they, it was apolog <coughs> apologies were written. Today, we understand that, Jack, that Pollock's assertion of the value of each life, its existential assertion of the significance of the mark, far outweighed the sloganism of the art at the time in its political effect. And we all feel that. So I encourage you to do exactly what I tell you to do, but feel free about that. So every organizational possible scheme, every kind of form, right angles, curvy angles, this, this is derived from the Piranesi, this is derived from Lawrence Halpern's picture of antelopes being affected by uh, helicopters. These are buildings having sex in public. I think that would be kind of nice. I mean, plus they're leaning on each other. Always important to show construction. I think you get the idea. Thank you. And I do. Thank you, Doug. 24 minutes. Hey, I get, I, I get four more minutes. <laughs> uh, we still have the time for questions. Six more minutes. What kind of questions are you going to put yourself? Okay. I, uh, I uh, spent 15 years in five days a week with Alan Bantz. <laughs> um, 
I pretty much exhausted every possible question I can ask myself. Um, so, no question? Yes, Bernard. The most refreshing, let me repeat, okay. piece in the Venice, history of art. Venice, Venice, not a piece of architecture, <laughs> not quite, not quite. But at least this year's Venice Biennale, uh, your best with your friends, and I'm talking the Ubrary uh, Kipnis tribe, was indeed the most refreshing piece of work in the whole of these, you know, all these pavilions. Now, I would like to ask you, why do you think it is that? What did you do or transgress that made it a piece of architecture that was alive while everything else was like in a mausoleum? Well, for one thing, I have to thank all the other people in the Biennale for the sobriety and banality of their work, <laughs> which helped me achieve the... No, it, uh, Common ground was understood to be a call for responsibility, for how we were going to be responsible. How do we achieve common ground among each other? How do we achieve a commonality in our purpose with the world? And all the work, and the, there is a kind of level of sobriety seriousness that invokes many of the relation, power relationships we discussed with each other <coughs> this morning when we were talking about the Serbian table. Um, we took common ground to be an invitation to understand the history of the ground that I put forward and to essentially produce not an original work, but a ludic, a comic opera on the problem. And we just got lucky. I have to say, it also benefits that the PBs and um, Peters are so white. Um, and so, I, you know, it was luck. Uh, <coughs> I tell you what, I had the best time in my life. I will never do it again. It cost a fortune. And it made me realize how stupid architects are because it is the worst business model in history for you to pay for your own competition entries. You're, you're not chasing profit. You're chasing off bankruptcy in the name of cash flow. I mean, I don't know how you do it or why you would do it. But, uh, yeah, so we, we made a, a few common rules, like try not, well, there is a whole art set of art architecture there called the architecture of cat dust. <coughs> so I got, I'm tired of shiny, I'm tired of, who knows? I mean, how do you know? I, I feel the same way about Peters. Like when he tilted that thing, he couldn't know that he was going to be directly engaging the gown in Santiago de Compostela the way he's doing it. Yeah. It was just he knew to do it because he felt it. And I trust that. I think, and so I, don't know. I appreciate your comments. I really thank you for that. Oh, that's Bernard great. being not only a great architect, but the single most persuasive and insightful critic working today. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to me in the case, and I haven't seen the project, but <clears throat> that in the case of the table, the table was, uh, had the heaviness of a trope. This was the previous. Uh, 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 the Serbian pavilion with a big table in it? Did you get a chance to see it? Yeah, it was presented a, like a, a, or this morning. Like a table, uh, one table. The table of the Venice Biennale. Yeah, yeah the giant, giant, beautiful. giant table. Impressive. But um, that in, in it, uh, in or Jeff said he hated though. it that. But <laughs> since they were both at the same event, we can, we can talk about them together a little bit. And that the, that the table was a heavy trope to which the effect, and the effect of the table was to produce a, what you called I guess, a false heaviness or, or, or an intimation that it was about power rather than beauty or something yeah, like that. Sublime. Yeah, sub sublimity. Of and so I wonder, and so in a funny way, it's like giving a tremendous amount of force to the trope and a lightness to the effect. And I would say in your project that you are lightening the trope 
and sort of making the effect incredibly heavy. In other words, the effect is not only just, oh, this is fun or refreshing, the effect is uh, that it actually is consequential and crit critically minded and, all, and so on. So I, I don't know if that was, so I don't know quite how this dynamic, I, I'd like to just hear more about that dynamic in the case of your project um, in particular. Since you're, since you are the president of the Effects Society. <laughs> um. Come walk the dog. Um, I, I think the effects, look, there was a period of time, all you were too young to remember this, where whatever reason could muster to justify your work became adequate. So if you wanted to do a library, you would go get a picture of the Gutenberg Bible, you would put it on a Xerox, you'd raise it up, you'd extrude it, it was a good library. It's a good library because the process was its justification. And it reached the level of absurdity that I think everybody that was involved in it needed to find a way out of. And so, you know, architects saying, oh, began to discuss the effects that they produced, which meant not the effects, like you had to be responsible not for the effects that you think your process might guarantee, but what, what you imagine your effects would be on others. And uh, it's a very tricky road because it means you're working in second person. You're doing all sorts of things that were consider, considered theoretically discredited. To, you, know, you, you cannot write a theoretical text anymore in the second person. You cannot think for somebody else. You cannot put a comment, you cannot have a narrator to a documentary for good reasons, because you don't, are not supposed to think for others. So to figure out how to in, dis, produce a discourse of effects, but also have that discourse of effects remain loyal to and faithful to the challenge, the way that architecture must constantly challenge its relationship to instantiated authority, is I think what we're trying to work through now. So, I know those, those kids had no idea about, I mean, you know, they just, it's a fantastic table. I mean, it's beautiful. And they did a really great job on it, and everybody was impressed by it. I was impressed by it. I didn't like being impressed by it. I mean, I, I resented how effective it was. I mean, you know, that, this is the thing. No one in this room doesn't dislike symmetry. What you dislike is how powerful it still remains. And so you don't, it's not a, it's not a cliche, it's a truck power that's so effective that you, that everybody in this room avoids it like a, like a plague. And so those are the ways that I think effects have, the discourse of effects have to supplement a discourse of reasons and, and uh, or, or foundational reasons. But does figurality try to dictate to some degree the context of the effect in, in a way? It was, you know, it, it's a, uh, well, I mean, part of it is to, you know, for example, I teach that there are only two archetypes in, in architecture, and that you can, that 90% of the buildings in the world will submit to two archetypes, the cube and the pyramid. And the pyramid directs the gown and sky, you know, it doesn't really matter. But, so in Haydick's work, to figure out how to put a top on a building, would actually, which does not engage the sky, but actually stops your eye at the top, was for me a breakthrough achievement. So my, you, if you become interested in, a, in a somebody's practice, for, who knows? I, I knew John, his, John had to be dead for 20 years for his tragedy to get removed from the work so that we can see it fresh for the first time and understand how really funny it is. But it also seems to produce a new kind of contextualism, a, a kind of you know, and that, I think, is always our job. Our job is to constantly reanimate the context that we're in. Given that you can never be outside of a context, you also don't have to keep reinforcing the status of the existing context. And so I'm looking for devices that will uh, give me a, a new catalog of ways to animate relationships to the context. And the figure will just seem like an easy way to go. I also, I mean, for people, some people say these things look like uh, Keith Haring, the, Keith, the figures. They don't look at all like Keith Haring. Every one of those things is, there is on the wall, nobody noticed it, a letter from Klaus Bollinger, which is, who is the greatest living engineer, I think, today. Many people work with him from Vienna. And it says, everything in this project can easily be built. 
and it signed, Klaus Bollinger, world's greatest engineer. <laughs> so it's not curvy. I mean, I, I, there's no debate in here between uh, organic form or blob form or right angle or left angle. You know, there, there, it, it's a kind of, and that's why I'm saying we actually have to obey the idea of not doing nouns, but doing relationships. So nothing in this project exists outside of its relationship to everything else in this project and also the other projects. And so the figurality just became one of the easiest trick devices to use. Mark Cousins? Uh, well, I'll repeat the question. Uh, I mean, all the way through the, your presentation, um, you fairly squarely commit the ground to being kind of horizontal. Mm -hmm. um, how does that deal with the fact that in a sense the figure ground distinction without which I don't think you really have, a, you know, why would it be a ground mm -hmm. unless it's in distinction from the figure. Uh, but the figure ground distinction is also all on the horizontal. Yes. Right? So, as it were, what's crucial in the horizontal combination of figure and ground initially is simply the status of, like, the outline that distinguishes them and gives you the possibility of reading one as one and the other as the other. So, it's, it's, the question's really about... Um, where the figure for you figures. Yeah, when I figure it out, I'll tell you. <laughs> because otherwise, it looks as though, you know, you've just been talking about the ground. Well, actually, I was trying to... And the ground is a kind of self-sufficient condition, whereas the ground can't be any kind of condition until it's contrasted with the figure. Well, I was trying to... Once you have ground as land, land is a figure. I don't think land is ground. In the, sense, the figure ground relationship, for example, I think um, land is ornamental. I mean, I think Mark's argument about the structural ornament relationship and the interiority are, you know, we are in the habit of seeing things as a ground that are actually operating as a figure, which is how it gets its power relationship. It's not a neutral, like, so even a figure ground relationship, the ground that you're talking about, for example, in a painting or in a drawing, uh, is operating figurally against that another um, the tableau. Um, but you're right. I mean, it is about outlines. I mean, in fact, yeah, you can see the point, graphics is all about outlines. At some point, outlines. your argument depends on the fact that the kind of theoretical term you're using is somehow isometric, isomorphic with something real. So the ground is the land. But I would have said the land is what you might call an agricultural term, uh, and then possibly a developer. So, you know, I mean, it's the, you never get beyond a discursive characterization. Um, me, or what? I never get beyond it. The reason I showed the history of those concert halls and the subsequent history of the, two, the move from 2 to 3D is to show the limited but active and successful way architecture in its own terms and with its own effects is participating. It cannot do what Corb imagined. It cannot turn land into data. The five points is about turning land into data. It makes the roof, the floor, the plan and the relationship <coughs> to the ground equal. It gets rid of the sky and it, through the windows, it gets rid of the sky and the, and the fort, I mean, it gets rid of the sky and ground. And not only that, it hides the door. So it does everything it can to disestablish land and produce this notion of datum. It was a powerful tool. It's incredibly successful. He was simply naive in that it imagined he would dis it would disseminate through a polis as opposed to to an audience. If we had another discussion, 
we would have to really distinguish between does architecture serve an audience or audiences, or does it serve constituencies? And I would argue that it's always hoped it would serve constituencies, but it's only served audiences like dance, like painting, like poetry, like philosophy, like music, like politics. Um, so I am, you know, I think, for example, despite the fact that his work is often used to uh, destabilize relationships between disciplinar disciplines, Derrida is one of the strongest of all disciplinarians. Every writing is about a great <coughs> philosopher. He stayed within his discipline, unlike someone like Deleuze, for example. Um, and so, and I am for that. I am for working within the discipline, finding out the potentials of the discipline, learning a history like you're talking about, how to see, how to feel to see, I think, for example, one thing that we didn't talk about last night is that contemporary architecture, one of the most important things it does is to keep old architecture contemporary. So it is impossible to look at the uh, Mies van der Rohe today in the same way before uh, Rem Gulen's work. Or, I don't know if you ever read this, it is the most incredible two paragraphs of theory in the history of architecture written Bernard, by Bernard Chumi on uh, Villa Rotunda. Now, you probably think of Villa Rotunda as the single most important work of stability and are perfectly symmetrical. Bernard, wanting to find a way to read highly formal work in terms of its event character, treats it like a horror movie. So it's like you walk in the front door, then when it's time to leave, you go to the back door, oh shit, it's the front door. And then you go out the other side, oh, so you get stuck in the twilight zone. And it's an incredible reading. And so because of his work, that building will never be the same. So our job is to keep, it's not that it all used to be contemporary, it's all contemporary today. So that's why we have to have the kind of past and history, and I think that's our job. So that's all I'm trying to do. Now, Ohio State is offering free tuition to any student who wants to <laughs> transfer. Uh, just see me later. Uh, we'll work it out. I'm sure we'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Tim.